So um, I'm really excited for our presentation tonight, and I'm pleased to introduce Dr. John Radulowski, who organized our panel, and then I'll let him introduce our panel members. Um, Dr. Radulowski is our Associate Professor of History, and I have to say that he is one of our MVP presenters for Ask UAS. He very <laughs> dutifully and kindly presents for us despite a very busy teaching schedule, and we're very grateful for him. He has a new book coming out um, titled The Frantic Seven, and it's about the U.S. mission of dropping supplies into Warsaw at the end of World War II. So keep your eyes open for that. And um, if you could, just join me in a round of applause for John and our panel. Well, thank you all for coming. And I don't know, we have a microphone. If people can't hear, we could use the microphone, but otherwise we'll just kind of uh, do it uh, you know, the old-fashioned way. Um, again, welcome and thank you, and thanks to... Uh, to Crazy Wolf Studio and Ken Decker, they have a, a great door prize they donated, and we really appreciate that. Um, and so, yeah, they were, were, this is the first the first time we ever had a door prize, so we're like, really <laughs> um, you, you, and she's winning, so yeah. So, uh, so just put your name in anyway and make it look good, so. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really happy to, to uh, have a panel here. Um, I um, originally thought about you know, doing something for Veterans Day, and then I thought, well, why should I talk about it when I have um, you know, people that I know that, uh, that could kind of talk about uh, something interesting and they have great stories. Um, I, I had uh, also a kind of an ulterior motive. Um, all these, uh, these three are all my students or former students and they're really great students and I wanted to get them back on campus sometimes. <laughs> so uh, that was just an excuse to do that in part. Uh, but no, they have some very interesting uh, things to say and um, I just kind of thought about this because, um, you know, once upon a time, uh, you know, when, when people came back from serving in the military, they didn't necessarily go into college. Uh, that wasn't that wasn't the, the norm, you know, back, way back when. Um, and now now it's a lot more common. Uh, so there's a lot of changes that have happened uh, with people, veterans coming back um, over the years. And um, just kind of wanted to. What I really wanted to do is to kind of. Get them to talk about their experiences because I know they're interesting. And in classes, uh, they've all, they've told me stories. And they've been telling little stories up here that are actually you guys should all write or get together and write a book. Actually, <laughs> uh, it would really really be fun. Uh, and just the, the funny stories uh, or touching stories or uh, you know what. Uh, and so uh, we have our four panelists. We have Catherine Coates who served in the Air Force, uh, Jamie King who was a CB in the Navy, and Jeremiah Tucker who was in the Army. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them introduce themselves a little bit, tell you, uh, they can tell you about their, uh, what I want to do is just kind of talk about, have them talk about their experiences in the service. Uh, and then uh, we'll have, I have a few questions, uh, but I also felt it would be really good to kind of open it up uh, for people who wanted to give their own experiences. And I know a number of people, we have a number of faculty, staff, and students uh, who have also served uh, in the military, and they've made that, they've made that transition as well. Um, I also picked the three because they're also kind of at different stages. I mean, Jeremiah's been how many years since we've been? Four, five. Four years. He's been out. He's been out. He's in the workforce. Ja Jamie just kind of finished up, and she's going into grad school. Catherine's got about a few, mm. few months left. Yeah. Of, <laughs> Next <laughs> semester, I have one class. One, so one class. So, might be fun stuff. so different stages, um, and I thought that would be interesting, too, to kind of have different maybe perspectives on, uh, on the things they've experienced, uh, both in military and in civilian life and then kind of transitioning into being a student as well uh, so I thought that would be interesting so if you guys could just kind of go around and introduce yourself and uh, see if you want to say a little as much as much or uh, a little as you'd like about your service uh, do you wanna... okay um, like you said I'm Catherine Coates I go by cat and uh, I was cat in the Air Force they didn't call me by my last name even my commander just I guess I have my own identity. Uh, I was in the Air Force for five years and got out in 2005 when my grandma was sick here in Ketchikan and they did not know how to transition, process me home. They actually thought my the ferry trip was a toll booth and they took it out of my taxes within three months and they're just no telling me you know, that's the way the government works. But now that we're a Coast Guard town, I think things should be smoother for that transition. Um, I My first two and a half years, I was in air traffic control. And then when we went to war after September 11th, I just guarded the tower at the bottom. And we never really got trained because all our planes deployed. And so they let me pick a new job. And I went into structures, which was carpentry, masonry, welding, locksmithing, and sign making. So that was really fun. I mean, air traffic control was like a 
air show every day, but it was so stressful that people have nervous breakdowns, and I was really relieved to go to construction. So that's my background. Um, my name is Jamie, and I was in the Navy with the CBs. And I actually went in as a construction mechanic and got to be a heavy construction mechanic. But of course, the military puts you where they want to put you. And I graduated second in my class and was awarded with prime duty. So I got to go to San Diego and weirdly enough, work on Cushman carts. So I did that because most military bases, they realized that they could save a lot of money on gas if they just did electric carts everywhere. And so I did that, and then I was stationed in the NATO base in Iceland. It's since shut down. But it was fun to be there for three years, and I really enjoyed you know, working on the heavy equipment there and plowing roads and making roads and you know, all the fun stuff, getting called out to the field for different things. And I was in for five and a half years, and they were like, come on, if you stay, we'll let you put on second class. And I was like, oh, no, I'll go home. So I came home to, you know, uh, do, I guess, the normal stuff, have babies and get a job. And I had thought that I was too old to go back to school. Like, it just seemed like really is there a point to go back at at my age you know and um one of my other friends from high school like broke down the math and he's like if you went to school now even if you didn't get any kind of degree until you were 40 that'd still be 20 years you could work at a degree level until 60 and then they don't really let you retire for social security until like 65 or 67 he's like are you really doing yourself a service by not pursuing a degree? And so then I had to jump through the hoops with the VA, which uh, a lot had changed since I was in the service. So um, that was an exciting journey. <laughs> Game of life. That's right. Uh, Jeremiah Tucker. Uh, I served in the United States Army. I was a 19 kilo uh, M1 Abrams armor crewman. Uh, the only actual tank. Everybody calls uh, Bradley's tanks. They're not tanks. They're personnel carriers. Just letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> FYI. No bias. No bias. Anyway, um, served in the Army for six years, uh, 98 to 2004. Um, I did uh, a lot of intrinsic actions. I was in Kosovo, Bosnia, uh, Kuwait. I was in uh, Texas in the uh, ELDC at a leadership development course when 9-11 happened. Uh, that got cut shorter. We all graduated uh, and got rushed back to our bases to, to be shipped off. Uh, it still took them uh, another year before they did ship my ship <coughs> off, but we went over to Kuwait that, that summer and we ended up doing a staging um, at the border of Kuwait for a couple months just waiting to see if we were going to go over, um, but we just sat there for, for a long time in the desert. Um, when I was coming up on 2003, we got orders to deploy. I was looking at re-enlisting. Uh, I was going to go for another three to four years. I uh, had a change of MOS. Uh, thing about a tank, it's a lot of metal, and I'd spent a lot of time in the desert. There are two temperatures in a tank, <laughs> hot and cold. There is no middle ground. Uh, we had a 138 degree weather day, and we had to close hatches on the tank. Uh, that was my defining moment of I am, I am out. I am not going back to the desert and I'm not getting back in a tank. Um, when I was prepared to uh, uh, re-enlist, uh, the stop loss happened. So all of my MOS changes, my bonuses for changing MOS uh, was taken away. And they said, oh, you can re-enlist because you want to. And I said, I'm going, not going back to the desert ever again. This is the last trip. So ended up getting out. Um, I got back home, uh, I was in Fort Carson, Colorado, uh, in Colorado Springs. Uh, stayed there for almost a year and then came back home. Um, and then it was a couple years before I decided to go back to school and was on the original uh, Montgomery GI Bill uh, and was trying to uh, support uh, my family, my wife, and I had two kids at the time. And it just wasn't enough 
money for me to pay for school and support them and you know for the salary I was making at the time and then uh, the new GI Bill came out yeah. post 9-11 GI Bill and, that's the uh, stuff yeah uh, that really pushed me forward to going back to school mm -hmm. an incentive of I'm not going to be <clears throat> losing money by getting the degree seeing an end goal in sight I guess mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. really inspired me to go back so was it, had that ever been a thought for any of you before you went in like hey that's a I'm going into the military because I can go to college after? Or did, did that ever? I, I did. I took I took uh, courses while I was in the military, and uh, clept a lot of courses and kept doing that. But you know, in a real way, and I'm sure that this happens, you know, to everybody. You have a job. You have a life. You know, you're going to college, and but life kind of moves on, and it gets less and less if you're not real fired up and if people around you aren't real fired up to see you get a degree um, you just sort of take fewer and fewer classes until you realize that it's been a while since you took any classes and you know the military even I think they support it a lot more now I hear that from people who are in that they're a lot more they supportive have a lot more channel, yeah. but at the time you know you had to get authorization to go to classes from your commanding officers and then they would still put you on duty or they would do something else and it would sort of and they did it just because they weren't thinking that you had a class or that you like needed to be there you could just catch up on that work later this is your real job which and they're not wrong you know but it made it more challenging well in the air force uh they kind of we kind of have a different situation <laughs> <laughs> they really push for you to go to school they try to make time for it. Not always, not every job either, or, you know, time frame. But they were always pushing school. I didn't, because of my transition in the job, I didn't take classes till with I got back from deployment, which was right before I got out. So I did my, um, finished my associates in construction technology within a week of getting out of the Air Force. Because I got out within a month time frame, I was switching to the guard. They had this thing called four shaping. They're downsizing the people, and I decided when my grandma got sick, I would just get out. So it all happened within like a month. I finished my degree, got out, came home, had no idea like what is a veteran. I enrolled in school here. Then like my life kind of started spiraling out of control. And so I went down to stay with my sister in Vancouver, Washington, and sign up for the VA, just kind of plug in, and like, what, what is a veteran? What am I like? Well, because I went to the VFW here, and they told me I wasn't a veteran. I was a girl. So I had a little <laughs> bit of bitterness. And so then I go, and I'm going to my first VA appointment in Vancouver, Washington, and got the address plugged into my phone. And I get there, and I go in, and I'm like, I'm here for my appointment. And... I start looking around and there's like all this dog food and leashes and I've gone to the veterinary clinic uh, and the, the, across the street was the VA clinic. That's, <laughs> so that was my introduction to being at the VA. So then life kind of got a little more normal. I started meeting veterans and like people thanking you and you're like, oh, you know, you, like, like he's talking about his deployments. Mine was a deployment, but I wasn't in harm's way. Mm -hmm. I didn't, like, have guns on me, you know, things like that made it hard for me to accept being a veteran, so. Um, I agree. Yeah. Like, and, and I think that I know a lot of people who weren't deployed to the desert that were like, like, Jeremiah is like a real veteran. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're like pseudo-veterans. Like, yeah. we served, but I was in Iceland when 9-11 happened, and it was weird because... I don't know if you guys know, most bases are like at least 50%, some of them as much as 70 or 80% civilian, but when 9-11 happened, all the civilians had to leave. And so it was weird, it became a ghost town, but you can't do anything, like, you know, so many civilians run the commissary, they run the school, they run, you know, everything, like the whole base was just shut down. But I was there until 2003. And so I came home, and before I had left, they were like, you absolutely will not leave the base in your uniform. You absolutely will not fly in uniform. You are not to be seen. And so they came back, and they're like, yeah, just go get gas in your uniform. I'm like, 
oh man, are you guys <laughs> hanging me out to dry? And then I'm <laughs> pumping gas and some guy comes up and he's like, thanks for your service, I'll pay for your gas. I'm like, dude, they pay me. You need to go ahead and go back to your car. <laughs> I'm good. Okay. You know, so it was it was a weird experience, you know, and again, to feel like, you know, like Jeremiah was in a tank in the desert. You know, I, Just I was just accepting I was in Scandinavia. It was I was cool. <laughs> I was in school. <laughs> right, like <laughs> on the Navy base. So yeah, it was def- I mean I did deploy after that and I guess starting to realize you're part of the mission is how he got there. Mm-hmm. Like we would build a base that was okay for him to come back through, you know. So right. learning that over time, which took I had like periods of life when I went to the military, the five years after I got out of the military, mm-hmm. and then when I had my son, and that's where I'm at now. And so um, I'm like two years into the next period where I'm going to graduate and go to uh, go to the next phase. I don't know if I'm going to be able to go to graduate school like her or get a job or what. But um, I'm on it, man. Yeah, she's doing what I want to do. <laughs> but um, so... So was it was it not was it, for any of you was it not ever when you went into the service was it not ever you, you didn't even oh. think about it or like what what you're gonna do after did you ever I was a high school dropout I uh, I was working uh, for my father who was uh, he laid carpet um, his uh, his knees were going bad and I realized that that's me in 15 years I don't think so mm-hmm. I need to find something I was uh, I was working at a computer store and a uh, recruiter came in and he needed his computer fixed. And he asked me if I wanted to join the military, and you know, oh sure, uh, <laughs> you know, GED. I was limited to my choices, and uh, that guy saw me coming. <laughs> I had uh, I had some good jobs on there. I had MP, uh, cook, uh, concrete construction pavement specialist. Ooh, you know how special. much those guys make out of the, yeah. out of service? It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Uh, armor crewman, and I think MP or something along those lines, infantry. And uh, they had a quota to fill on uh, Armor Crewman's because he sold me. There was a video with a tank shooting, and it was like, you know, rock rock and roll music, people running around. You don't ever Going have to fast. mechanic. You're never a mechanic on that. There's a mechanic that will work on your tank for you. All you do is drive it and shoot it. Yep. And how old, how old were you? How old? Uh, 18. 18. I was almost 18 when he talked. I was 17 when he talked to me. See, so. and, and that's kind of how I ended up in the CBs. I was going to go to college, but then college was so expensive. Yeah. I mean, I and I and I guess I had friends that were a year ahead of me that were dropping out of college after obligating their parents to 15 or 20 grand. Like, I can't do that to my parents. And so I can go in the military, and they're like, wow, you've maxed out a couple stats. You can do anything that has to be with doing a, being a secretary or... You can do anything that has to do with construction. I am 18, and you see this attitude now? It was living large at 18. So I was like, "Uh I'm going to be no man's secretary. I don't know what you're thinking. So I went into the CBs. I would have been a damn fine secretary. Um, And I was an okay mechanic, but um, I was very much, you know, and Kat sounds like she had a little bit more of like a, a good flow. For me, mechanics was algebra. Like, there's a starting point and an ending point, and it's just starting here and going through until you find what's wrong, you fix that thing, you keep going until you find the end point. Is anything else wrong? No. Does it run correctly? Good. You know, and then you just keep working the systems. But man, there were guys that I worked with that were like, the tank whisperer. (laughs) <laughs> like tanks are running and they'd be like oh, I think it's loose on A8 let's tighten that one and then let's oil it and then let's and like how do you know that and they're like I, I went to school with you you don't like have more tank experience than I do and they just they could just hear it they just knew which gave me a lot of respect for um, my father's in construction and he can just look at something and know he has a lot of experience but um, I could beat those guys at tests, you know, and I would try and help them study hard, but man, some of those should have just been out in the field, you know, and, and I've talked to them since and tried to get them to go to college and they're like, oh, 
the service test kill me. College is going to be like the service test. I'm like, it's not as boring as the service test. You can do it, man. Come on. Well, I, uh, I thought I would stay in for a career and then, you know, kind of wavered. Sometimes I'd want to get out and all that, but I signed up for my GI Bill and it was 50 bucks off each paycheck, $100 a month for the first year. And we got the Montgomery GI Bill and then I didn't really care about it until I got out and started going to UAS in 2005 and I had to have a full-time job student loans and the Montgomery GI Bill so then I ended up doing my thing going down to Vancouver then I switched to I got ended up like maybe within a year getting disability and I was told that I could um, go under vocational rehabilitation. And so I started pursuing that while going to the Art Institute of Seattle. And that was racking up more student loans, still using the GI Bill in the transition. Mm -hmm. And then I fell in love with the fishermen and <laughs> decided to transition to uh, California where he fished. And um, then the voc rehab, they want so much control over your education and where you live and sleep and eat. And, you know, like they just need to know everything. And my West, living on the West Coast was not stable enough for them. So during that time, I ended up having my child and still traveling up and down the West Coast, which I loved the lifestyle. And But I was being pulled by voc rehab because every time you say I'm living here well but I'll be up in Alaska for the summer they're like well then you need to transfer to them and then they lose your paperwork in California for six months and they even though there's computers they lost it so um, they this transition I'm just like in a like in a vacuum limbo. or I don't even limbo and so then during that time they're like well maybe it's not a good thing for you to do voc rehab maybe you should think about this and so I'm just like fine no school I move back here and I don't know what I'm doing I break my leg and I'm like I need to do something now I've got a broken leg and it was my injured leg from the Air Force so then someone said the GI Bill's changed have you looked at it and I'm like what and then so now <laughs> I like I get paid more than most people in town not most people but like I feel like I do like I feel like I live great with my GI Bill I mean they make it so I don't have to work and I can be a mother and a student, and there's a mission, you know. I feel like that was a big thing about going to school is be, having a mission like I had when I was in the military, you know, like an end goal. And I'm about to reach it, so I don't know what my next mission will be. <laughs> Maybe find a job. <laughs> but, so, okay, what were some of the challenges, the biggest challenges you felt when, when getting out? You know, you talked a little bit, you each talked a little bit about going to college, but what were some of the other challenges along the way to, as you were? Uh, challenge for me was, uh, you know, just uh, kind of the desire. The only thing, you know, that really pushed me was uh, um, my wife. Uh, I got out, I had, uh, I had a couple anger issues. Um, I had trouble controlling my temper. Uh, so my wife decided that it was best if we moved back to somewhere I'm familiar with. Um, I had, uh, Walking down the street, I tackled her onto the sidewalk because the car backfired behind us. Uh, <laughs> she got a little worried after that, and you know we uh, we had a car. You know, cars in the neighborhood would go by or something, and I'd have to check the house and make her stand outside while I checked the house. Um, so she wanted me somewhere I was more comfortable. So uh, ended up back here, and you know, getting into you know other things is I didn't have a desire to go back to school. I didn't actually think I was smart enough to go back to school. Um, but my children were also having trouble, um, with a lot of the same difficulties I did. And I thought, I don't want them dropping out and thinking they can't complete it. So I started going back and that was, uh, convincing myself I could do it was probably the hardest, hardest thing I had to do is looking at it and just thinking of all the work and then it was money and, you know, the team here really is is outstanding uh, Gail Klein I wouldn't have come back me after too. the first time if Gail Klein hadn't called me and said hey this GI Bill's changed yeah. you need to look into it and kept calling yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. see yeah. me on the street when are you coming back I have That's an appointment great. for you yeah <laughs> yeah it was a uh, challenge was just motivating motivating myself I also feeling kind of 
after you get out feeling kind of rootless, you know, because you have a lot of, it's a very insular place, the military is, you know, you you have a lot of, it's a lot of rules, but it's also a lot of structure. You are, you are going to be fed, you know, it's, it's the floor you can't fall beneath, you know, you are going to have a house, you are going to have food, you are going to have somebody, you, you don't know what to do, I I'm, gotcha. happy, I'm happy to provide that for you, <laughs> you know, and um, getting out and then feeling like it's just such a different experience than other people have had. So the jobs that you had don't have necessarily the same weight that other civilian jobs have had. And so trying to talk to people, they're like, oh, you're a veteran. What does that mean? You're like, I, it means I was in the military. Mm -hmm. You're like, what did you do there? You know, stuff. Sandbags. <laughs> you know? Sandbags. <laughs> and... <laughs> You know, so trying to put it in, in different terms and trying to, you know, like, um, <laughs> so Professor Radoslavsky asked us a while, a while ago, you know, hey, I'm thinking of doing this. Uh, would you guys mind being presenters? And I think we all were like, yeah, right? And then he sent out reminders. And then today uh -oh. I called and I was like, hey, I called and asked Karen what time it was and this is what time we're going to be here. And he calls me back and he goes, so you guys just radio silence? Is that how it is? You, uh, you, I send you like eight emails. You can only respond to the first one. And I said, we told you we were doing it. Like the rest of them were just kind of informational, weren't they? It was an order. I give them an order. Right? And, so, and so I find that, you know, we still do that. Like, you know, if Jeremiah goes, hey, can you help me move? Be like, yeah, sure. You know, and then the next time he's going to get back to me is... Tomorrow's the day I need to help you move, me move. It's going to mm -hmm. be this time. Like, okay. You know, it's not... And I guess that other people, like, have a lot more back and forth. Yeah. But I don't experience... Or need, <laughs> like, like, the conversation. Like, but it's or, need, conversation. or need the back and forth. Okay. Or like, like, okay. like that need negotiation of, like... <laughs> you know, but uh, Jeremiah and, and I were both in TSA, and one of the things that it tells you to do is, like, and repeat back. You know, if somebody tells you to do okay. something, you, you, you repeat it back to them, and we're like... <laughs> That's dumb. <laughs> what? Did, they, yes, did you hear them? Right. You know, and so, um, so it's been I'm a thing. Not a talking robot. <laughs> right? It's been a thing to like, but you can't say it exactly like them because then they'll In think they're mocking words. you. Yes. Like, all right. So you be like, um, I really need you to go and get this from the store. What I hear you saying is, you need me to go to the store for you and get this. You know. So when you don't. When that's not part of your uh, repertoire, you just stop doing it. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, he's with it. He knows. We'll be there. We <laughs> yeah. said we would. <laughs> and uh, it's funny that all three of us fell into that pattern. Yeah, I agree. I, I used to talk in, in air traffic control. We talked in phrases. So when I tell people, like, when I know what I'm talking about, I'll start stuttering. But it's not because I have a true stutter it's because I'm thinking in these phrases and it was I was trained at the moldable age of 18 to 20 <laughs> you know or 21 no I was 19 to 21 of to speak in phrases and to be like and so like my family thinks I'm pissed off and yelling at them but I'm just trying to be clear and keep it like in a phrase and so like Succinct. retraining that that was a hard one and I would say, like, generally, feeling normal was the biggest challenge. Like, even though I probably would appear normal, but I didn't think I looked normal. I either, in, if it was in school, I felt like I was older, or I felt like I had this different background that made me stand out. Even though I didn't, maybe I stood out for other reasons, but I thought it was because of my past in the military. So that was probably the hardest, just feeling normal, like, just a human being, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe everybody feels that way. It just right. seems, you know. Well, mine is because of the past being in the military. You know, that's, and like she said, That's what you attributed to. Every, yeah, everybody has the want to feel normal, but I definitely felt like I, like she was saying, you know, having these connections, and that's probably why we came back to our hometown is because, mm -hmm. We wanted to have that connection, although everybody still had their connections and like people I went to high school with, I didn't like just go hug, I missed you. It was like, hi, I'm Kat, you know, or you know, like mm -hmm. kind of they don't, I don't feel like they know me you have to anymore. Start again. Yeah, 
So there's been some who I've reconnected with and some I haven't, and that would be the biggest was, issue. Was it hard to explain to those people what it was like to serving? I mean, especially the people who are, I mean, people, total strangers, you know, maybe it's easier with but, yeah. your, but your close family, your friends, people you grew up with, was it hard to, like, you know, can, can you feel like you still, can you relate to them or that, that experience? I mean, you, you have other experiences outside of having served, but you have... I was an exchange student my junior year of high school. I was fortunate enough to be able to go to Sweden with Rotary, and it was a wonderful experience. But I went, I came back my senior year, and people would go, how was your exchange? And you would go, oh, it was great. And then they would start talking again. You'd go, is that all you wanted to know? Mm -hmm. Just that it was, it was good? You know, and so in some ways I feel like the military is that way. Mm -hmm. They go, how was it being in the military? And you go, it was okay, or it was tough. And then they start talking again, like they don't, I feel like very, people aren't callous about not wanting to know what's in the military. Like they're not doing it to be um, bad or offensive or anything like that, but they don't have a point of reference for it. And so they just want to hear that you're okay or that it was tough or that it was interesting or they just want that sound bite and then yeah. to go on and talk about normal things that are happening yeah, in like, life. Yeah, I feel like with his situation, he said he was married. She kind of understands that whole life. My fiancé, he still doesn't know. He's like, that happened to you, or you did that? or You know, like, she might know more about my service than he does, and I've been with him eight, almost nine years, and I've just known her through school. And so... I feel that way with a lot of veterans. I was just at the VA clinic in Juneau on Monday, and I was so tired because there was a lot of events going on in Juneau, and I get to my appointment an hour early, and I'm sitting there thinking I could sit and sleep in the seat <laughs> like the good old days and waiting, hurry up and wait, you know, and this veteran gentleman starts talking to me and I'm like oh it's almost veterans day I can't be rude and tell you know not that I would have been rude but that's kind of how I feel I really wanted to sleep and he starts telling me about my service or his service asking me about mine and that's just a normal thing to exchange with the veteran like you can be anywhere and have that connection and um just with your family like they they don't know. They don't really. They don't always know. They might know some things. I think it would be easier for them to know through, like if we did write a book. Here, read my book. It's harder to talk <laughs> about it than. I don't know. Just. Yeah, I found that uh, I was uh, better with uh, friends in uh, that weren't close. Uh, they didn't ask a lot of questions. They liked the funny stories. I was easy to share the funny stories. I did find that. Uh, uh, Back, coming back to college and having a younger group of people around, and I would tell some of the stories that uh, most of my friends think are hilarious, uh, that I have a warped or a skewed sense of humor. Because <laughs> uh, a lot of them look at me in horror, or, or are you serious? You really did that? Of course we did that. That was, that was great. No, no, apparently it wasn't. Um, but uh, it was, uh, you know, it was a really difficult for me uh, talking about anything that was serious, I don't think I, uh, I don't think I shared many things with many people. Even still, uh, they're personal. They're they're mine. Um, talking about them makes them more real. Mm -hmm. um, makes me have to uh, fill that again, and I I don't want to. I I'm enjoying my life. I enjoy where I'm at. I um, I found a cathartic. Is that the right word? Way to deal with the stress I was under. Um, now I don't even get angry anymore. I don't feel like, you know, pressure is really pushed I mean, down on me. I'm not as angry. Well, <laughs> yes, yes. I suppose every once in a while. I do have children, you know. I, they, do, they do push the buttons. But, no, it's, uh, you know, it, it took a while, though. Um, it, took, it took almost ten years, I think, before I felt, I guess, what the word would be, normal. Yeah. I felt normal the whole time. I figured everybody else had, uh, had a lot of personal issues. Or, uh, yeah, or... Talking to people, you can kind of almost, it's weird to have to tone down things that you say. <laughs> yes. I was an NCO in the military. I talk loud. You know, when I'm talking to somebody, they feel like I'm talking at them. Or if I get excited about something, I don't change my facial expressions. 
so they think I'm getting louder and angrier or, or upset. I'm not. I'm just excited. This or, is fun. <laughs> I, I get loud, and there's a lot of things that aren't cussing that I learned to express my frustration with people that apparently make people cry. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I've seen you do it. It works. It's swearing it's, was a was a difficult challenge for me though. I mean, if I didn't put at least three or four curse words in any given sentence, you nobody would have thought I was serious. They would have. I, you guys need to mow the grass. That grass would never have gotten mowed. Not one time. You know. You guys need to mop and sweep the floor. They'd have thought. They'd have laughed at me. They'd have walked off. What's going on here? If I didn't have at least four swear words in, in a ten-word sentence, if half of it wasn't cursing, they would have ignored everything I said. Yeah, colorful descriptors oh, to yeah. express my disappointment <laughs> oh. in the job that you have done. <laughs> you know, because if I, if I was just like, hey, I went in and I saw the way that you mopped that floor, I'm dissatisfied with that work. <laughs> That would have, no way. They would have been like, ha, 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 it's party time. No, you, and, but again, it's weird to transition. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird to transition in, and you think, I'm, I'm doing fine. I've got that under control. And then you make somebody else cry. Or somebody set you off. They, or somebody set you off, yeah. yeah. My aunt, I worked for her at her restaurant in Craig after I got out, and she said something to me about eating the rest of a yogurt the day before winter closing and it was like no big deal i was trying to finish it off so it didn't go to waste and she thought i was eating them all the time and it was like this big deal to her and i just like i don't know what i did i went into maybe one of those modes but it trickled down through my family that i had a psychotic episode and to me i was just pissed off that she like confronted me yeah and i was like would you rather me eat a french fry i mean come on like um it was weird to me that like it rumor has it i went psycho and i was like because i was just like if that's how you feel then i don't need to work here but whatever i might have went into like one of these descriptive modes they're talking about but I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Yeah, I got pissed. She said something. I said something. End of it. But to other people, they just thought, like, she's something's going wrong. You know, like, maybe I need a loony bin. I don't know. Yeah, it's, the intensity level is just yeah. turned up. <laughs> I don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you know, and, and just uh, from my perspective, uh, when, when I get you, you know, I get uh, veterans in class, I see some real advantages. I, I see you guys motivated. I see you know you're willing to work. <laughs> I don't have to tell you twice. You know, <laughs> do you see it? Do you see like do you feel like you have some good things that came out of that? Some advantages that you now take into this, these next phases of your life? I definitely do. Air traffic control. We had to study all day and all night, and I learned how to take tests um, and like multiple choice. I can pretty much narrow it down. You know, all those things they try to teach you to take, do well on tests. I've done all those, and I feel like um, I, didn't, I wasn't very good at writing. Like, he can attest to that. He, he turned back my first it's paper, but I'm better. doing better. better. Yeah. I, I've seen improvements since then, and but just the fact that I could, I've learned how to get through something with the time frame I have. I'm the best procrastinator I know, and it's probably because I've learned to crunch things into time, and I, you know, um, I just feel like if I hadn't gone through the military, I wouldn't be as disciplined to do it. And it's not that I do it like, okay, spread it out through the week, and now we're studying here. It's like I just know that I have to do it, and I can do it, and I do it. And I learn to cut off things that I that aren't priority or that um, last minute. They're just not. They're not deadlines. Deadlines of, I've never been good with them until I went back to school. I realized because in the military, it's not really your thought or your deadline. It's just a whole unit. But with my personal going to school, it's just me. And so now I've realized I can meet deadlines and I can do it and make it presentable and just I'm proud of myself of what I can do now through going to school.
good. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, other things, advantages that you feel because oh, you, you, you took away that? Um, <laughs> you are not special. <laughs> you are not special. Um, oh, you know. God. Hold on a second. <laughs> Give that one a moment to sink in because that was... Uh, that was hard. That's a hard lesson, especially coming from here. And you're seeing everybody in the same class that you're in. I mean, you're getting the same assignment. You know, I had a full-time job, three kids, and I'm seeing, you know, this kid that doesn't have any responsibility except going to school, having problems with the deadline. And I'm like, oh, I can get that knocked out. I'll take two hours tonight after midnight. Everybody yeah, be asleep. Midnight. I'll get it all knocked out and I'll be done. That's great. And here they are complaining that they didn't have enough time. And I'm just like, what do you do with your day? <laughs> My pencil <Lord."> broke. <laughs> oh. You know, but also the... the um, I guess that other people have those opinions, yeah. and you can just let it go. You know, it's that you're not... I, I think that when I left, I think that when I graduated high school, I really felt like I knew a lot of stuff. And, you know, maybe that's everybody's 18-year-old experience, but the military was really like, you know, you're not special. This is a way that it's going to be done, and that's how it's going to be. And that having had that experience and going back into civilian life, you see some people really swimming upstream. They're like... Well, I just got really got to be committed to it being this way, and I have this vision. Like, hey, you're not that special. You need to go ahead and let whoever's in charge make that decision, yeah. or you know, ask a question. But if the answer is no, then the answer is yeah. no. That maturity level definitely changed. Nobody told me what to do, and then I went to boot camp, and they're like, "Oh, you," and I mean. You know, you're not, you know, just, they called me Miss Thing from day one. And I was wearing plain clothing, no makeup. I was just, I will blend. And they found me. And then they found out I was from Alaska. And there's another way to pick at her. And and then coming back, you know, I just, I guess going out there, you realize how special we are in Alaska. Mm -hmm. You can go anywhere and you say, I'm from Alaska. And they'll treat you like royalty and want well, like to know crazy. everything. I mean, well, that it's a fine too. line. It's a fine they will pee test you too. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's the, the the thing about being from here. We're so unique, and um, coming back here, just with that world experience, just made me feel more mature and ready to be in school. Like I was not ready then when I graduated high school. I was had some ideas, but I was aimless. Um, then I got. Yeah, I would say it took the time of maturity, but that experience really tailored me to be able to care about school or know that I need to complete it, not just do it. And like I mean, not I just dabble. Yeah, yeah, I needed a commitment and a mission, so that would be a cha a positive um, outcome. So, do you guys have advice for anyone who? Is a veteran, maybe they're getting out now. If you if you were if you were to talk to your younger self, like uh, all the th what would you you know tell them? Especially whether whether it's going to school or other things that you would say, hey, here's what you should do. You know, you're thinking about getting out, or you're uh, you're a veteran, you've come back. Um, you know, here are the things that you would do to that I would do if I had it over again, mm. or anything like that. that you'd... Really research and take advantage of the programs that are there. Yeah. I mean, you there are a lot of really great programs and really great support systems, I don't feel like they're well advertised. Um, and not because they're poorly advertised, but just because it's a very, it's not a significant portion of the population that a niche are group. veterans. Yeah. And so, you know, like, um, like, I didn't have your experience going to the VFW. I, I went to the VFW and they were amazing, but they were always like, oh, but you can't join because I don't fit the criteria, which is okay. But they were always like, but you can come, have a great time. It's fun, you know? And I had a lot of veteran groups that were really nice that way. But, you know, get go, jumping through the hoops with the VA that you really have to 
be committed and you have to mm -hmm. keep your own record you have and you have to like that monkey at the grinding wheel Push. like you have to keep you know calling people back and you have to remember their names like mm -hmm. email and texting is amazing that way because you have a whole string of emails that's you know no I talked to you about this it was on this day you know and uh, so when I went into the military like you were asking if we thought we would go to college I didn't take my signing bonus I took the Navy College Fund and the Navy College Fund is something that now that I've converted to the post 9-11 like GI Bill which is great it means that I have to completely exhaust that benefit before I can go on to the Navy College Fund so I have to completely exhaust it and then start all over so we're taking this... PhD here? No, yeah. <laughs> no, because, you know, like, I, it, it expires here and then it goes on, and then they had other programs while you were in the military, the top-up program and different things like that. But um, having the VA, like, give you those records, whoa, man, that's arduous. Um, and not because they don't want to give them to you, but because they're locked away mm -hmm. back in the abyss, and they... Too many people are looking for them. So yeah, yeah. I was twenty three, twenty four when I got out. Math again. Hold on, I didn't. I didn't graduate with math, so that's that's <laughs> not my degree. I was twenty three. Uh, they handed me a file that was almost four inches thick, and were like, "Here you go. Here's your army file." And they didn't say, "This is going to be important later. <laughs> you want to file this somewhere safe." I'd never had to keep a record of, my, of myself. They always made a copy for me. And then they went and put it in my file. And then they handed it to me eventually. I didn't know what to do with it. I, I think I kept my DD-214 and everything else kind of went out the door as I walked out the door. So At least you got it. I got a cop. I asked for eight copies of my DD-214. <laughs> I knew I was going to lose some of them. you know. And so I asked for eight copies and they said, and your file's going to NARA. And I'm like, wait, no, give it to me. And they're like, which papers do you want a copy of? Mm -hmm. I, I don't... All of them. Mm -hmm. You can't have a copy of all of them. It's my file. And it, uh, that doesn't belong to you. <laughs> it belongs to you. You're like, it's a round robin thing. So I ended up with eight copies of my DD-14. But no file! <laughs> it went away! Well, I know that there's a... Uh, it's a government-mandated class, TAPS, Transition... Assistance program, mm -hmm. and I didn't totally pay attention. It was kind of <laughs> cool to get out of work and go to it. Um, but they have they tell you how to keep a checkbook and all those other things you don't know how to do when you're in the military, I guess. Pay your own bills, and <laughs> they tell you to go to the dentist and all these things. And they say you only have three months to do these when you get home. Well, you get home and you're like, "Woo, I'm free!" And you just you're all that goes out. And so I lost out on a lot of immediate benefits so that would be one of the main things I would tell somebody getting out and to find a mission even if it changes find a goal because if you don't you're gonna also feel aimless and um, like she was saying all the resources like one that like um, sprung up on me they found me on Prince of Wales Island when I was just living there this group of people and there are so many of them that do things like this these ladies that um, quilt a quilt for a veteran and they made one that was really feminine and they said I want to find a female veteran and they had <laughs> gone up there for vacation so they're like is there any female veterans in in on Prince of Wales Island and the people start like going I think there's one and then they found me well they found the other Coates family and then they found they said, no, that must be cat coats. And so I just, I brought something that they made. And it was made by these ladies. And it, this is what sealed the deal and made me, like, accept that I was a veteran. Because there's people out there who really care to make you feel like you're a part of something still. And I really cherish it. And they've got, like, sayings, That's stars cool. and stripes. And... This is the kind of thing you want when you're a veteran is to either be a part of this or those people to find you to make you feel like you're I don't know what you know what's the feeling but 
That's really cool. Okay. I just decided I'm going to start using it really and not just keep it in the little bag. <laughs> but right now. <laughs> yeah, just have a mission is the hardest part. And definitely go to school. And if they say no in the VA, you can appeal that. Keep asking. And if they say no, you can appeal that. You can appeal. It's just as much paperwork. It's hours and hours of sitting on hold or keeping track. But you can do those things that you want to do if you... And the more you ask for help, the more people will help you. And it doesn't matter your age. It does not matter. You can go and get these benefits and you can say, I was, because I have a friend who just lost his leg to diabetes and he's like, I've never signed up to be a veteran. And I'm like, you still are a veteran though, you know, let's go do it. You know, it doesn't matter how old you are, just go tell them. And they, there are people there who appreciate your service, so. Okay, well, thank you. I wanted to just open it up as well to people who had questions, or maybe some of you have your own stories. I know a number of, we have a number of veterans here as well uh, who want to share a story or something like that. Um, or if you had a question for any of the folks here on the panel. I think it's really interesting to listen to your guys' story. I really wanted to be here. I had class tonight, and I skipped out of class and had somebody <laughs> nice. take over for me, which was kind of neat, so I could actually come here and listen to you guys. And it brings back a lot of memories for me, of course. When I was, when I went in, and I, I joined in 78. Oh. And in 1979, when I was going through boot camp, well, I was in boot camp in 79, it was kind of funny because they came up to us and they said that, hey, here's the deal. We've got this new program for you guys for your benefits. Well, they changed it in like 1978. Mm -hmm. So in 1979, they said, okay, when I was in boot camp, I was making $238 a month. If we wanted to join this program for the first year, you would have to give them half of your pay. Mm -hmm. That was the deal. So, 90% of everybody in our unit or our company said, we're not going to give yeah. you okay? <laughs> yeah. You're only making 230 you know, something a month, and now, now you want half of it? Yeah. No way. Yeah. So everybody opted out during that time period. Mm -hmm. So we lost out. That whole generation of servicemen lost out on any VA benefits or you know, college benefits for the future. I mean, there was a small percentage that did it. And, you know, another thing, you know, when you get out at, at later time, as far as your record keeping, you know, you said that your your file was that thick when you got mm -hmm. out. My file was that thick when I got out. Mm -hmm. I was in for almost 11 years. Wow. So, I mean, and there's not a lot there. I mean, and in the same way, you know, you, you get home and what happens? You throw your... Throw it in a yeah. door, or it goes in the Forget box, all about it. The storage box unit. goes away, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then there's, of course, in Kansas City, where, where they had the fire. Mm -hmm. There was a fire oh, in Kansas yeah. City where mm -hmm. something like I don't know, was it, fifty, sixty thousand records, records were, were lost. lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you backtrack? You know, how do you how do you verify these people's service when there's no record? I mean, for the most part. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was also a flood that lost another. Almost 70,000 records. So, you know, I'm, I've got a service disability. You know, it's funny when you were talking about 9 11, when 9 11 happened, you were, you were down in Greenland. I was in Iceland. Iceland. You were real close. Iceland. <laughs> so you were at Kempelvik before they closed it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was funny when that happened. I had been out for a while and I've, I've got I've got a disability. I mean, it's not, not like a major disability. I mean, there's a lot of guys that get disabilities for very small things, and uh, some of the older veterans don't go back to the VA to get those benefits because it's, they just, cut not, and run. it's just not the thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you almost have to pull teeth to get these guys right. to the mm -hmm. VA, including myself. But it was, it was just kind of funny, 9-11, what did I do? First thing I did is I went to the recruiter Mm -hmm. and I flew to Anchorage with the recruiter because I wanted to get back in. Mm -hmm. For a year, passed the physical, did everything I needed to do to get back in because I had a disability, which was a non-life-threatening disability. I had to actually go to send a letter to Washington, D.C. to get it approved. 
uh, through the Medical Bureau back in D.C., and I got turned down. But I wanted to go back in and head over and just go back in after 9-11, but it never did happen. But so, and then I did reserve for a while, you know, that was when it hits off, but for some reason it Alarms go off even yeah. when it's on silent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I just find it interesting listening to your guys' stories. You know, I mean, I probably have, what's, what's, what's funny about listening to you is, I have a trouble, my trouble is going back to the VA. Because I didn't have a great experience. Mm -hmm. So, and that's probably a big issue for a lot of people that are coming back. Um, the VA, was there anyone the VA. that had a good experience with the VA? The, it, <laughs> for me, it, it was it was just that it's it just takes time. Mm -hmm. Everybody that I spoke to at the VA was really wanted to help, and recently, within the last ten years, they've done a lot of cleaning house with the VA and yeah. firing a lot of people and really trying to get it straight. But um, it's just that it's an arduous process. But um, this handsome man over here is my husband. And I really, really, really strongly urge you to, to bite the bullet and go back to the VA. Um, his father waited too long and, you know, was in pain and didn't want to go back to the VA and finally got bullied by his daughter and, you know, died of cancer that could have been prevented. He had, he was in at the same time period. He had a lot of benefits. And again, as the World War II veterans die off, um, those benefits are rolling back, you know, and so now it's later era benefits. But again, if you, if you got out of the service for a reason and you didn't have a great experience, a, a lot of us don't want to go back to the VA, don't want to deal with them. You know, we got out for reasons, you know, yeah. and it's hard to go back and, and again, because it's arduous, it's hard to keep keep plugging at it. Again, I have talked to a lot of very wonderful people at the VA, but it's, the matter of it is, is that I have to call three days a week for a Sick month and job. a half to get something done, and that's where you get bogged down. Nobody but Ken, for that. hey, we're here. We'll help you. We'll go with yeah. you. <laughs> um, the VA, they used to just start, they just started sending me prescriptions for like I don't even know what, whether it's sleeping, coughing, headache, you know, what, depression, PTSD, you know, they just, I started having, I could probably fill this with the stuff, I never took any of it, and I started just like, it would just be in a junk pile or something, and that's how they used to try and take care of it, and then like she said, being on hold, and the hours, and the time, well, then I, when I broke my leg, they were supposed to be paying for it here in Ketchikan, then I got billed over $100,000 and it was going to go to my credit. And then all of a sudden there's like on the news about the VA's issues and I, mm -hmm. I still felt like it was out of, out of reach because we're here. Well, then I get this letter with a choice card and I get a phone call saying, do you remember when this happened to you? How can we make it better? What do you want? And so that's where they're at right now. They, I just was up there and like, let's find you a doctor in Ketchikan. You can come up here if you want, but if you don't want to, you can go there. So that's this transition that they're making, and it still can take time, but they're trying, especially in our remote area and our situation. So I would not. And Jeremiah's not in school anymore. He got time. He can help you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have no experience. <laughs> I got out. I got out, and I was uh, given a medical, and I was given a percentage. I don't even remember what the percentage. It was 10 to 15 percent uh, for disability. Um, I had a friend that was seriously injured. I mean, he he lost part of his leg, and uh, that was somebody I said, "Oh, he needs the benefits. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. fine. My knees give me problems. My ankles give me problems. I'll just suffer through it. It's not a big deal." Mm -hmm. um, I still haven't gone to the VA. I just don't have a desire. I have too many friends that are either still in or forced out that. Just, mm -hmm. I feel like that's that's time they could be focused on them, and I'm not, you know, exercise and, and eating right solved most of my problem, you know. But MREs aren't good for you, if you didn't know that. That's <laughs> one of the things, a lot of people feel that way, that they're, it's like when in one of the books that you had us read, 
with some people suffering doesn't seem as bad as theirs you like weigh it but it's really you still are suffering you know so that is a mindset and that's a choice to make but there there's veterans who have let it go so far like she was saying the father-in-law you know he might feel the same way he did and say well i didn't that didn't happen in the military but i don't need that benefit or whatever but they say these are your benefits and you go get them and but also from from an mba point of view they want to budget the money for you for mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. for you but if you don't tell them that you have a need they don't know that you have a need and so the money will go elsewhere the money will go elsewhere and really um veterans are are great politically you know they're given a lot of money and again this is sort of like um being too proud to take unemployment benefits and i think i know that when i got out of the yeah out of the military i was like i can just go get a job i don't need unemployment benefits but i ended up needing them and i thought i don't want to be a deadbeat on <laughs> unemployment yeah, I was, I'm with you, there. you know yeah. and but the fact is is that i already paid into it <clears throat> You know, you already paid into the VA taking care of you. You you already earned that benefit. Don't don't feel like because it's not going to take away from somebody else's benefit for you to have yours. Yeah. It it really doesn't. You know, they 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 want to give that to you, and and we, your fellow veterans, want you to have that. Mm -hmm. You know, because we want you to be around for as long as possible because. There are We're fewer and fewer people. Yeah. yeah, there are fewer and fewer people going in. That's just how it is. And so our narrative is kept alive by us. I can tell you, you know, Jeremy, um, there's a lot of people with your mindset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of people out there with that particular mindset. They don't want to go back to the view. They don't want to go through Thank that. You. Well, I spent 11 years down on the Coast Guard base. And they document, record everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, from a broken finger to a hangnail to whatever it might be, and, you know. And there was one thing that I, I mean, you don't want to go. It took me 14 years to go to the VA after I'd gotten out. You're a long ways from that. <laughs> so you got to jump start. I mean, you could actually do it. All right. But, you know, that was a long time ago. But one thing that I found that was kind of crazy is that there was a lot of guys that were in the Coast Guard that 50, 60, 70 percent disability, and I'm just kind of sitting back, just listening to guys talk about the disability that they're getting for things that I personally didn't think were mm -hmm. worthy. Worthy, yeah. you know, compared to just like what you said, the guy lost half his mm -hmm. leg or whatever, mm -hmm. and then it's like I almost took my finger off a couple months ago. And my partner's a retired Marine Corps colonel. He's been through. He was a black ops Marine Corps officer. And he was over there with you. I mean, he, he's done a lot of crazy stuff. And I was complaining to him on the, on the phone saying, I can't get up to my oyster farm because I almost took my finger off. And I said, I really can't complain about my finger. You know, it's really hard for me to complain about the finger, thinking of all the guys mm -hmm. who have been seriously injured, I mean, mm -hmm. mentally and physically. So that's how I gauge things. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it makes it harder for that mindset mm -hmm. to go in and actually have somebody, you know, examine you. Yeah. Right. Or right. judge you. Well, I felt my ankle, they gave me 10% when I broke it, and I felt really stupid because I would tell, you know, it's like I was ashamed of my disability because I didn't do it during battle. I did it while deployed playing on the Air Force volleyball team. <laughs> <laughs> So I was really embarrassed, but it was disabling me, like I have trouble walking, you know. Then it got so bad I have two titanium plates. But had I not gone and got the disability, they wouldn't have covered the surgery for the two titanium plates later in life. And because for f the five years after the military, it was like flopping over and never, you know, strong enough and it was really bad. And then when it got so bad I needed a hundred thousand dollars worth of medical care I was covered and so that's why I 
have learned that it's really important to have all that in their system and to take part in that. I guess it's just a mindset. Yeah. It is. It, it's it is. hard. It's embarrassing. It it's a lot of it, I think, just, you know, where you're from, how you're raised, you know, how you, my personally was a lot of my uh, senior officers and NCOs and uh, how they, I, I don't want to say raised me, but I mean, I was an impressionable kid and and it was, you work hard, you do what you're supposed to do, and you don't complain. Mm -hmm. There's no benefit. There's no fun. That's, you do your job. You know, that's what you're yeah. expected of. Those guys that are getting disability and you can't see it, unless they're crazy. Right. Uh, yeah. unless, unless they're crazy, they're, they're scammers. They're whiners, and they're just taking people for a ride. You know, I remember that in the military, too. You know, can you walk? Then walk. You know, can you do this? You know, it only counts if you lost a leg or you lost a limb or, you know, something happened that, you know, you can look at them and go, okay, yeah, you need disability. I don't like the feeling of going somewhere with my hand out. Right. You know, unless I'm helping someone else up. You know, the difference, though, is your hand's not out, you've already earned it. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, and, you know, it's it's easy to say part. it. It's, it's hard yeah. to feel it, though. It I, don't, I don't feel like I earned it. I had... I left. I left guys over there. I ETSed mm -hmm. out Me too, because yeah. I didn't want to go back in. I feel that. I, and it's natural to feel that you haven't earned it. Right. But that's in mindset too. Right. I told, I'm, I'm not denying any of it. But as you were speak through this whole process, and I noticed that Perry's here, and uh, <laughs> I, said, I got up and wrote a note to Shelley here. It said, "This is." so similar. It's like I'm talking to somebody from, uh, because I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the mid-80s in a country where I can't go to anymore right now, Niger. Mm -hmm. Wonderful place. I was there during the drought, and we worked in my in my service, we worked with the Marines that were there, and Niger at that time had six Marines. Whoa. <laughs> and they were there for diplomatic reasons. So I was there when Libya flew over our airspace to bomb Chad and, and all of that in the mid 80s. But we worked with them and what people forget with military is that they are also there for humanitarian mm -hmm. purposes. Mm -hmm. It's not just always combat or right. mechanical or building or, or mm -hmm. for humanitarian purposes as well. And so when you said that, Kat, you said you didn't feel like you did as much as mm -hmm. Jeremy or as much as Jamie Jeremiah. and vice versa. Jeremiah, it's Jeremiah, right. Jeremiah, it's Jeremiah. It's all right. Jeremiah, Tucker. Uh, yeah. Say it three times fast. Everybody has their own niche and their own purpose, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of commonalities of coming back and that that feeling that nobody really gets you. And mm -hmm. everything that you were saying, even though it was a different type of service, mm -hmm. totally get it. Now, mm -hmm. Jeremiah, I'll run into you someplace and we can have a great chat chat. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. But um but you have earned it. Yeah. And and that whole mindset it's 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 I think it's more of how one has lived their life from childhood on and how you see that because I think it's a heightened sense of justice, a heightened sense of service. Mm -hmm to others and country no matter where it is, whether it's locally here or halfway around the world. Ed, you had a question. Well, I, I got out uh, after almost 15 years in the military, and um, I ETSed out uh, February 24th, 2010 from the Army National Guard, got out as an NCO in five, and I remember standing in front of the formation for Sergeant's formation, and I told you know, the uh, formation was never always give your subordinates your a sense of purpose and a mission, mm -hmm. and don't ever forget that. It's, it's something that I want to leave with with the unit that I was leaving is your subordinates always give them a sense of purpose and a mission, you know that. and. That still echoes. I take the ethos with me even when I left the Army. I cross-branched from the Air Force, by the way. Smart move. 
<laughs> and uh, it's it's something that it's just the same like you can take the man out of the marine corps but you can't take the marine out of the man it, it goes with every branch you know it's it's something that it's a culture it's in it it's a, it's a programming you get programmed into a culture it's a it's a separate culture it's its own world when I left the military and I could relate to them is a lot of our basic essential needs were taken care of. Our shelter, our food, all of that was taken care of so we could focus on the mission. I think the only thing we could we paid for was our own cable and our own mm -hmm. cell phone service. Everything else was taken care of. When you leave the military and you leave and if you're like you're not career or something like that it's a big change it's a big change from one culture transition to another culture to this, the civic side of it one program and the thing is when we leave the military they don't de-institutionalize us <laughs> mm -hmm. they do not and they, they try to <laughs> they try That's, to i remember we used to play that yeah. game of like here's an acronym what do you think it means for people that haven't been in the military? Oh. <laughs> and we're like, ooh, I so don't know. There's, there's none of this deprogramming. They don't have a program mm -hmm. for that. They, like you said, they gave you your files, your DD-214, done a great job, you serve honorably, mm -hmm. move on. Mm -hmm. So, so, so reality of it is uh, what next? You know, we leave, what next? We go through some things, some programs. Like they asked all the trainers in the military about war, could they ever truly prepare the sailor, the soldier, the airman for war? Every one of them said no. You can never truly prepare yourself. It's just like stepping out of the military and going back to civilian life. Mm -hmm. We could never truly prepare ourselves for that. It's life changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at least we have something that we can take with us, some, if we can say, worthwhile benefits. <coughs> we can take some. So just to shed some light on that. Yeah. And again, thank you all for your service. Thank you. Well, thank you. Good questions, comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'd offer this to all of you. Is, uh, it stays with you a lifetime. Uh, I went in 1968, and served for six years, and um, that's the belief. And there are things that you don't do, that you're not talking about, and it, whatever it is, it comes later. Um, I have had a very successful life, and those of you who know me, it's, uh, I, very, I'm very happy. I have a single family with one of the children. But there are things that creep in uh, back that we don't talk about. We just don't. And you know what it was, and it may not have been in a combat situation. It may have been just something that happened to you in that environment. Uh, one of the things that's glossed over is the issue of PTSD. Mm -hmm. It's assumed they treat. It, it's been treated as if that's something that comes on pretty quick, and maybe in your age you might see it. It's showing up more and more into my age, and I'm, I'm 68 years old. And, uh, and they're finding is that many of us who got on with our lives, we got kids to raise, I got a family, I got to earn a living, I got time for this. It's still there, and it creeps back in. So 50 years later, it's still there, mm -hmm. and we struggle with it. So talk to people, talk to you, find your peers, I have peers that uh, I communicate uh, either by cell phone or by email uh, that I've known. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of my group left. Uh, I was uh, First Marines. And uh, we lost uh, 600 battalion, 167 that year. Wow. And over 300 wounded. So wow. it stays with you. So don't feel bad that it stays with you. Jeremy. But we need to tell each other it's, it's still there <laughs> and it's okay. Um, and, and again, I served also on the eastern border with 11 Cav, 
I switched over because I got, I got ripped out after when Vietnam was winding down, and I wasn't fit for uh, public consumption. <laughs> so uh, how you feel there? <laughs> so it's uh, it takes a while, and it takes. And I was very fortunate. Uh, by the time I started to meet my wife and uh, got my life going the right direction, but I always thought that I'm over it. And uh, pretty much in my 50s, uh, when I realized I wasn't, I went to the VA, and I had a very bad experience in the 70s. But uh, in 2000, I had a very good experience. And actually, they said, where have you been? And immediately, they said, well, here, you got this disability, you have this, you have all this. And I mm -hmm. used the GI Bill. But yeah, so I, I commend you for coming forward, sitting up there, because it would be difficult for me to have this conversation. And some of the folks in this room have uh, worked with me, and that, well, I, Easy going, no stress. Well, because I measure all stress by that experience. <laughs> you know what? It's always dying here. You're right. right. It makes it a, a really and, different measuring stick. And and no and many of you, your work, you know somebody else is going to depend on it that may have their life responsible for it. You know, getting supplies in for the Air Force, yes, by the way, CVs in Vietnam, oh cool. Those guys. It's just, you know, you don't have to be at the front end of the spear uh, to have difficult things happen to you mm -hmm. or observed it. Uh, you know, all you have to do is uh, have a cough and take off an airplane. It changes you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's definitely true. I know my, my dad served in Vietnam. He was uh, there pretty early. And um, a lot of stuff he didn't talk about, um, but he's now, he's um, going on 80, uh, but he's, He's actually telling me, I've actually learned more in the past about his service in Vietnam than probably in the past two years than I learned in all the other, you know, almost 50 years that I knew. Yeah, so definitely, definitely the case. It's more, he feels like, you know, people are passing away and he feels maybe more comfortable, whatever reason it is. Yeah, yeah it's weird how you, like, can almost block out your time. Like, I felt like that was a totally different person. Like, that happened to me. I spent those, that time in the military, you know. Sometimes I feel like that's not me, but then there'll be times when a memory or a smell or a feeling, just this road in Rapid City, like I will think about it all the time and it doesn't mean, there's nothing to do with that road, but it's my time in Rapid City was the closest knit people I had been around. And I just went back there and got to go on that road. I was there this summer and met my, um, the person who trained me on how to weld and I deployed with and my first trainee that I supervised. And he actually came to Alaska, and now he's getting medically discharged. Like So that whole feeling like I left them, I got to go face them, and it was actually, it was good and bad, bittersweet, but just now we've reconnected, and like, you are real. You know, like I see them, and like, got to see, see them in the place that we were, and that was healing, and now we actually get in touch even if it's a hey how are you what's up how's your out processing come hunt with me you know just like we're real people again we're not i'm not blocking it out so it's been really and i really appreciate your advice knowing that because i think every winter i get a little more of the depression because of the weather and stuff but it a lot of it is like those um, that mechanism in my brain that, like wants to escape or run or deploy or you know this needs something and it's just normal and I should reach out to people who understand like the same the same feeling I guess you could say and by the way a woman four is a track vehicle <laughs> <laughs> the 114, yes. But that's, that's about all it is. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a personal carrier, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's not a t anything with tracks does not make it a tank. That's that's, that's true. bottom line. M1 Abrams. Uh, that's, yes. that's a it's that's a tank. Full definition. You know, I almost have to go with the Leopold. Uh, Leopold. Uh, they make a Germany makes a great tank. <laughs> they really do. Before I draw, can we have a show of hands? Where are the veterans in the room tonight? Yeah. Thanks you you raise service. your hand too. <laughs> Army, ninety-eight to two thousand three. Yeah. Nice. That's almost the same cool. time. Yeah. Same time, yeah. me too. Yeah. I was listening to you guys talk. I was like, oh man, that's my peeps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
And I want to thank all of our panelists and I thank all of you for coming, for your service, and for coming out and participating. Thanks. Yay.